Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Rita, I'm the Community Outreach Educator at the Crime Victim Center in Faith County. This is the first time that the panel of all four of these organizations have been represented at the same time. So they're here to tell you a little bit about what each one of their agencies do, the services they provide to victims of child abuse. And when they're done, you get me again, and we'll do some questions. I know some of the things we're going to talk about today will be stressful or triggering for some people, so part of it is a difficult conversation. Feel free to get up and move around. The back of the chart, well, my right, your left. Over there, there's several, so you should be good to go at the time if you need to. And again, please be respectful. I don't want to have to yell. So um, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. I believe we're going to start with Gina Diari, the Administrator of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Rita. Hi, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's not just during the month of April, it's every day for the staff at Children and Youth who are trying to make a difference in our community. And there is nothing I like better than seeing when the community comes together to, to work with us, and I do appreciate each and every one of you coming tonight. Um, I'll start off with what Children and Youth does. Um, our responsibility, we are the county agency that is responsible for investigating all allegations of child abuse and neglect in the county of Fayette. The state of Pennsylvania has, has legislation that requires each county to identify an agency, and in Fayette, that's us. We receive referrals from um, phone calls, walk-ins, uh, letters, um, email. We can receive referrals from anybody. We, there are two types of um, individuals that can make referrals, mandated reporters versus non-mandated reporters, which is your general population. Non-mandated reporters can call us in anonymously. Um, once we receive a referral, we're responsible for assessing the information we've been provided, determining whether or not those allegations meet the definition of the Child Protective Service Law, and if so, then we become involved with doing an investigation. Just because we're involved does not mean the allegations are accurate. Um, that's the initial phase. When we're going out, we're meeting with the family and determining whether or not our services are needed or our intervention is needed. Um, our primary responsibility is to assure safety of the children in our community. Once we've assured safety, we look at wellness and permanence, whether that be um, in their homes with their families or in another circumstance. We are, by nature, an intrusive agency. Nobody likes CYS, right? Um, all we do is come out and make people's lives miserable. That honestly is not our goal and not our purpose. When we become involved with a family, we want to see that family thrive. And we want to see that family have the best that they can possibly have. And the services we provide are for that purpose. And there are circumstances where we can't assure the child's safety, and we have to intervene. And in those circumstances, we look at what's in the best interest of that child, which we all know, if we couldn't care for our own children, we'd want our children with family. So we start exploring family, grandparents, anybody that child may have a relationship with, school teachers, coaches, Anybody that's going to make that child feel safe and comfortable until we can resolve the problems. And again, our goal is to work with that family to try to get that family back together in those instances. Um, in addition to our um, abuse investigations, we have several positive community um, programs that we offer. One of them is the Plans of Safe Care, which is um, open to any child that is born exposed to substances, whether legal or e illegal. And those moms are entitled to supportive services up until that child is one year of age. 
to help them with the um, special needs that that child may have. And again, that is a program offered through our agency. We have a truancy prevention program that works in the schools. We are currently in three school districts in this county, and we work with the kids and the families to try to keep them in school where they can be educated. Um, we have an independent living program for all of our youth that are involved with the agency over the age of 14. And we work with those youth to help them to grow and get the necessary skills that they're going to need so they can be a successful part of our community as they mature. Um, it's kind of a quick overview of what we do. Um, I have a very special staff that loves to do for families. Um, we do a lot of fun activities. We have dress down days and you bring in food and so we can take a box of food out to our families. And we do clothing drives and um, we had a pieing incident not too long ago, um, which ultimately benefited our families. So anything that we can do to help make our families stronger, that's what we want to do. Um, I think that's an overview. Unless you want to jump to me. Oh, we can jump to you. You okay. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Brittany Liptak. I am a forensic interviewer at a child's place. So what a, the overview of a child's place is, is we provide forensic interviews to kids of suspected abuse, whether that be physical or sexual, and any type of witness to violence, witness to drug use, domestic violence, anything going on in the home. So our referrals will typically come from Gina's agency, CYS, and they also come from law enforcement. So typically that's who's calling us. So we, the goal of the forensic interview is to be and talk with the child in a non-leading manner. So we're not coaxing, coaxing the child, we're not coaching them to say anything, we're not leading them to say anything. We provide a neutral location, all of the entities, law enforcement and CYS can come together, watch the interview by the trained professional, which in this county is me, and um, it is video recorded so that way law enforcement and CYS can take that DVD, rewatch it if they need to, and then further their investigation. We do take it as a multidisciplinary approach. So what we saw back in like the late 80s, early 90s, kids were being interviewed about nine times, on average nine times. So they may go to school, they tell a teacher, the teacher talks to them, then the guidance counselor, maybe the principal or a nurse, and then a report's made, a caseworker will talk to them, maybe their supervisor needs to talk, and then law enforcement comes out and they talk, and you can see it just go down the line, then they go to the DA's office and they talk there, and they, the kid had to tell their story over and over again, and obviously that's your traumatic experience. So we tried, it, we, back in the 90s, they tried to lessen that by coming to a neutral location, having their um, story told one time, have it recorded so then they can use that to further um, the investigation. So that's about it for the forensic interviews. Um, we do say that our agency, it's a two-part process. So the forensic interview is the first part. We also provide a med medical consultation and exam with a certified physician and or nurse practitioner. So we have both. And what that looks like with every single kiddo that comes through our door, we will recommend a medical exam. It's non-invasive. It is not like a female's typ typical gynecological exam. They don't use any type of instruments that go inside of the child's body. They have a special tool and it's called a colposcope. So it does magnify the area. So they, the child does get undressed, but it will look them over. The doctor can um, look at that magnified area, see if there's anything that may be abnormal. It is important to note that what we know about kids' disclosures is that it's a process. So they may be disclosing abuse months or years later. So oftentimes those findings aren't there. But it's still important to have the medical and have the child even just go consult with the doctor 
just so that we are telling the kid, you know, we understand what happened, we hear your story, your body looks okay, it's working properly, and it just gives them that reassurance. Our doctors can also talk to kids about anything else. So we've had kiddos come in with like acne and they don't, unfortunately, can't make regular PCP visits and they're not always in front of the medical professional. So our doctor can help them do that and just any other concerns that they may have. We recommend that for all kids in the family, whoever, um, any kids that are involved with the family and have access to the perpetrator or vice versa, the perpetrator has access to the kids and the siblings, even if a kid is not disclosing. There's different research and what we have also seen, unfortunately I've seen firsthand, I've had kids not disclose and they go to the medical and they have had findings. So we think that that's you know, a strong piece in that um, investigation and just the process as a whole. Also, a child's place has a law enforcement liaison program. So we are fortunate enough, our law enforcement liaison for Fayette County, John is here tonight. So we have our main office in Pittsburgh and we have four accredited satellite offices. So Fayette is one of them. Washington, Westmoreland, and Beaver County are the others. So we have different law enforcement liaisons for all of them. John's basic kind of goal overall um, is just to provide some support to law enforcement agencies. If there's any gaps that need to be made, if they have any questions about, um, you know, hey, should I make this referral to you guys? Or what should I do next with this? How to handle it? they can definitely contact John. He takes um, like our DVDs and provides that support as well. We can help do trainings and just educate on the role of the forensic interview, the role of the medicals, and just provide different trainings like that. So we're always here. In addition to that, we have family advocates. So our family advocates will follow the family right before the appointment. They contact the family, um, you know, date, time, where to go, all of that. They sit with the family in the waiting room. So again, providing support if the family has any questions, anything about the process, the family advocate is there for them. And then the family advocate will follow the family and child victim up until two years. So they call at different time intervals and they will just check in. How's it going? Is your kiddo still in counseling? Do they need any services? In addition to that, our advocates has helped family find um, furniture, clothing, we've given resources for food banks so they can help with all of that stuff as well. One last thing about us, we also have a parenting program, kind of like an umbrella. So we have healthy parenting and under that falls two evidence-based practices. One is Triple P, so they use the Triple P curriculum, and the other one is Parents as Teachers. So that is offered to any family within Fayette County. There is no income guideline for that. And basically both of them um, are parenting programs, a little bit of a different style. So they're just working with the families, identifying the beha behaviors in the child, seeing what needs to be helped with, and then advocating the parent, kind of teaching them, working with them on how to work with the child. So I think that's, a child's place in a nutshell. <laughs> Do you want to go, Corey? It's okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Corey Berry, and I'm the director of CASA Fayette County. And among the panelists here, um, I am the executive director of the newest program in Fayette County. And it's like, very exciting that CASA is here because I was able to work with them for four years in another county and I've been able to see firsthand what they can do. So what is CASA? We are court appointed special advocates. So ultimately when CYS does have to remove a child or become court active in the home, they are able to have a advocate appointed to them through the courts. So a referral's made to us and what we do essentially is we are an extra set of eyes and ears on the kids and we're able to advocate and work with everybody here on the panel um, to really get the kids' best interest out there. So we are a volunteer-based um, program, so they have 30 hours of training, um, which is really exciting, <clears throat> and we are also doing additional training now for healthcare advocacy. Um, so they meet with the kids every month, 
they go out in the homes, um, either home of origin or in the foster home that they are placed in, and they have the time that caseworkers at times do not have. So what they're doing is really helping and assisting the process. Um, if a phone call needs to be made, my volunteers can make that program because they're focused on one at most two families at a time, when our CYS agency can have, I believe the state statute is up to 30 still. Um, so we're able to really assist in that process when the child does become court active. Um, we work very closely with all of the providers um, in medical facilities, so we're able to review medical records, we're able to review school records, and we're able to be part of everything in the child's life and with the family. Um, our volunteers are working under a court order. So when we receive that court order, they're able to send that court order on to um, the doctor's office, because we all know that if, if here, getting a hold of a doctor's office and getting records and to see if that child's up to date medically is, is a lot of a difficult thing. So working under a court order and that volunteer really being able to assist in that type of involvement is very beneficial to our kids. Um, when a CASA volunteer is assigned, statistically, um, they're less likely to come back into care. So they're that consistent person from, at most times, adjudication to permanency, whether it's return home or adoption or PLC. Um, they're able to stay with the kid that entire time which is really wonderful because turnover at times can be very difficult at a CYS agency. So that person is able to be there for your kids and be there through all the changing programs and be able to be there for the hard conversations. And we're not a state agency, so kids at times find it easier to talk to a CASA because we can take them out and side and play on a playground. We can take them to do other things that CYS unfortunately at times doesn't have time to do. Um, I do have a volunteer um, and he's actually here. He was able to attend a memorial service for his kids on his caseload, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, what we're able to do is really find what is in the best interest of these kids and advocate for that. Um, it's a really great program, and we are looking for volunteers. So um, <laughs> if you want to volunteer, you can come on board. Um, it is a national program. So while Fayette County is a small program at this point, we are looking to grow because it is a national program, and we are affiliated with PA CASA, who are really beneficial to us as well in our advocacy. Um, and I think that's all. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Awesome. <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, our, that's our hashtag. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Hibbs. I'm the executive director at the Crime Victim Center here in Fayette County. What sets us a little different from my fellow panelists is we don't just work with children, we work with adults as well. So. Basically, um, our organization is a nonprofit, and we started in 1975 with a group of volunteers at the time that felt there was a need to be able to offer supportive services to women who were sexually assaulted. So as that need grew, we grew as well as an organization. So in 1982, we became incorporated, changed our name a little bit. Uh, we are also known as the Community Resources of Fayette County. And we got incorporated, got our 5013C, and really went crazy on expanding services. Um, we were able to apply to, to get additional funding, which allowed us then to be able to provide more services to the community. I started at the organization in 2000, so I'm working on my 23rd year here. And we've seen through the years our programs have evolved. So some of the things that we do uh, with our programs, which are all free and confidential, is one of the first things that we do is offer counseling services. So we have three um, counselors on staff that work with children, they work with adults, and we work with family members, significant others who may also need our services. Then we have um, legal advocates, who we also have three of those individuals. 
who are able to go and follow the victims through the whole entire court process. So we usually start at the magistrate level, or again, with, with my fellow panelists, we sort of all work really closely together. So a lot of our cases are also, have been involved with Children and Youth, with CASA, and with the Child Advocacy Center. So we get a lot of our referrals from those entities. And once we're through the court process, my legal advocates are able to provide that support, emotional support and advocacy for those victims to ensure that their victims' rights are met. Because those are one, that is a big fundamental uh, process with our organization, that is a strong feeling that we have at our organization is to be able to make sure that those victims' rights are heard. So our victim, our advocates go through the whole court process from beginning to end to make sure those victims are notified of court hearings, they're able to offer support through all the court processes, do the referrals for counseling if they need that, or we also have a program with Victims Compensation, which is a financial assistance program that if you qualify for, you're able to apply for those funds. And we have tra uh, trained staff that are able to provide that service to those victims. Uh, along with counseling and legal advocacy, we also provide medical accompaniment. We have two hospitals here in Fayette County, Penn Highlands and West Virginia University Uniontown, which um, will contact us when they have a victim that will uh, go to their doors and need a forensic, rape, a forensic rape exam. We will provide that service and accompaniment to them. We don't provide the forensic rape exam itself, but we will offer the support and assistance to be able to um, be there for that victim and explain the process. A lot of times victims come to the hospital and they're distraught, they're in crisis, and they need someone to be able to explain to them what is going to happen to them. So our staff uh, have a 40-hour training that is provided that allows them to be able to provide that, that emotional support and assistance to those victims. And that is offered to anyone ages 14 and over. If you're 14, if you're 14 and under, we refer them to Children's Hospital, the Child Advocacy Center, to be able to provide that forensic exam that they need. Um, so we follow them through that process, and that can be a very emotional, traumatic ex experience for them. But that's important for us to be there, so we offer that support to them. We also do a prevention education program, which is held in all of the schools here in Fayette County. Some of you younger people probably have went in the schools and have had those programs at your schools. So we have had that from day one, and we also continue to provide that service as well with all of the schools, preschool all the way up to post-secondary schools. And that teaches us about um, personal body space, peer pressure, bullying. Um, we do gun violence programs. We also do um, peer support. Um, Basically, the good touch, bad touch, but we don't like to use that program anymore as far as the, 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 the name of that program. It's more of having um, ownership of their own body and who they allow to enter that space. So um, we are able to teach children that it's okay to tell, who they can tell, and that they have the power over their own body of who is allowed to, to touch them, offer support, touching, hugging. Um, I know a lot of people are, are huggers and like to hug, but we try to teach our children that if they don't want to be hugged, it's okay to say, I don't want to be hugged. So that is incorporated into our school programs as well. Um, dating violence, because we know junior high and senior high age, we have children that are starting to have boyfriend, girlfriends, or significant others, and they want to be able to know that they can be safe in those relationships. So we try to teach them what that is so that they have a better understanding of that as well. So we have been very successful through the years of being able to reach thousands of children through uh, thousands of children through all of the school districts to be able to provide those programs to them. We have a very healthy, I'm going to call it a healthy outreach program. Um, we are able to go out into the communities and offer any information tables, speaking engagements. This is an outreach for us tonight um, in order to reach the community and teach the community about our services and what they can do as a community to help themselves and help us as well. So we are always in being invited and if you know somebody that would have an outreach event and want us, please reach out to all of us because we all go to outreach events. So it's very important that we can all come yep. <laughs> and talk about our services and educate the community because that's what's important is educating the community. Um, we also offer parenting classes, which uh, is different from the Advocacy Center. Ours are also uh, an evidence-based program. It's nurturing parenting. 
Our referrals come from Children Youth Services, where we have a parent who may be in jeopardy of harming their child or may have already offended their child. So they uh, will be uh, contracted to come to our office and provide uh, a parenting program. It's an 11-week program that we have a counselor uh, provide that program. We, through COVID, it used to be an in-person program, but through COVID we have learned that we can do it virtually. And we have been very su successful with that, with the attendance, because being an 11 week class, we would have parents that just would not follow through. So with it being virtually, we've actually had a lot more better outcomes of that program, being more successful with that program. And our educator is able to uh, provide reports if needed to go to the court system, if uh, a judge requires it for any type of hearings, we're able to provide those reports to the, to the court system. And we've expanded that program and we, it sort of just seems like every 11 weeks we have a week off and we start another 11 weeks. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's a sad situation when we have those types of requests. However, it's important that those individuals are getting those supportive services that they need and the education that they need. So it's, it's very important that we, we are active with those programs. And then we do have a 24-hour crisis hotline that is available seven days a week, 365 a year, that provides any type of crisis. If anybody's in, please contact our office. Our information's at our tables. Everybody here has information tables, and that's vital because if you do need somebody, we do get a lot of phone calls on our crisis hotline. We have staff that man it, but we also have volunteers that are able to uh, maintain our 24-hour our, our, uh, hotline. And again, that's something that's essential here in the community that we feel is needed. We have a volunteer program, just like uh, Costa does, and we also always work with the volunteers. So if that's something that if you feel that you might want to be able to go to court with a victim or do our hotlines or help with fundraising events, because unfortunately, being a nonprofit, we receive grant funding, but a lot of our services we provide are not covered under grant funding, which means that we have to apply for uh, fundraisers and donations in the community. And that will help offset anything that our grants will not cover. And then our, one of our uh, final things that we offer, we have parenting, I'm sorry, I'm, we have the parenting, but we have transparenting, which is a four-hour parent seminar that parents or individuals that are having custody issues. They are able to attend our four-hour seminar, and the four-hour class really talks to the individuals that are going through custody issues about, you know, not putting that child in the middle of a situation, not fighting over that child, um, explaining what happens during holidays when you have to share a holiday, um, what happens when you're court ordered to pay child support? Where does that all that money go to? So it helps the parents and the individuals. We're getting a lot of grandparents now that are going through our classes um, that are having to fight for custody for grandchildren, especially with our opiate epidemic that is going on. And we're having a lot of grandparents raising children now. So they are going to have, they're going through our classes. And it, 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 we have a lot of success with that. That program we have done for I think 20 years now we've been doing that program here in Fayette County. And we get a lot of positive feedback with that through our court systems with that program. And then our final program that we offer is a Victims Compensation Assistance Program. That program is for any person that has been identified as a victim here in Fayette County. It is a world known program. Every state in, in United States have that program, as well as outside internationally, they have a victim's compensation program somewhere, somehow. Every state has their own rules and regulations in Pennsylvania. Really, our, our qualifications is a crime had to occur. They want you to report that crime to someone, even if you did not know who the individual that was that provided, that, that, that caused the crime. And you had to have at least $100 out-of-pocket expenses. You do not have to have income bases. You don't have to have, if you have insurance, some insurances you have to utilize first, but then that program kicks in and will, 
will cover your medical expenses, unfortunately funeral expenses, and we've had a lot of those here um, in the last several years. So we're able to help offset funeral expenses. Medical needs, like I said, counseling, if you do not come to our agency where it was free, but if you decide to go to someone independently, it'll help pay for counseling services. Mileage and travel back and forth if you have to go to doctor's appointments. Um, we have individuals that, um, due to DUI crashes, if they have a, a disability as far as like a leg injury or a back injury and they require a lot of physical therapy, we're able to help with those transportation expenses to be able to get that individual back and forth. So the program is, I think, one of the best programs out there to help a victim, and that program was in 1975 that that program started here in Pennsylvania. And it is not taxpayers' money. That money is generated from cost and fines from juvenile and adult offenders. So part of their court costs and fines that they have to pay goes into this general fund of pool of money. And then that money comes back out to help victims of crime. So in the last several years, they've averaged anywhere between, I think it's been $7.5 million that Pennsylvania has paid out for victims to help pay for their, uh, um, like I said, their medical expenses and funeral expenses here just in Pennsylvania alone. So it's a very wonderful program. I, I, that was my baby when I started at the organization. I, I had a passion for that program, so I always wanted to plug that when I was out into the communities because I think it's very beneficial. And again, it helps a lot of our, all of the individuals that we serve here, it's all been beneficial. So um, I think that's all in a nutshell what the Pilot Life Center does. So, uh, but our, real quick before I start, backtrack. We do work with all, we, our victims are zero from birth all the way, I've had, I had a victim that was 100 years old, an individual that was victimized. So that is the difference between us, that we work with all ages and all demographics, all ethnicities, we work with everyone, which again, they all do as well, but we, we don't just work with just children, so. Thank you, I took up too much of your time. <laughs> so. as birth to 18. 18. Unless they're involved in our independent living program and then 23. And then child's place? We typically are three to 18 as well. Three being that you have to be able to talk and come to an interview. However, for the medicals, we can do infants to age 18. We will also see adults with disabilities. So Down syndrome, intellectually disabled, anything like that. Um, law enforcement can make that referral to us. Um, same thing as CYS, birth to 18, um, unless in dependent living is a CASA. So then 23. Thank you. I'm begging my volunteer. Does anybody else have a question off the bat? Commissioner Dunn. So if uh, a member of the public wants to issue a, uh, or call in a report to somebody, who are they calling? Are they calling the police? Are they calling The, yes, um, if the child is at immediate risk, um, a child unsupervised darting out in front of traffic, your first call is gonna be to law enforcement because they can get there much quicker than our agency can. Your second call would be to us. Um, we would respond. Um, we have to have somebody on call um, and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week as well. Um, our normal hours are 8.30 through through 4.30, Monday through Friday, and then we have one person on call uh, during our closed hours. And that individual is then responsible for taking all the calls, plus responding to those things that need responded to. So it can get rather busy. <laughs> so we always say if that child's immediately not safe, call the police, call us second. And what's your phone number? 724-430-1287. That is our 24-hour line. I will also include, not to keep button in, but That's we are all mandated reporters here as well. So even if for some reason you don't call the police or you don't call CYS, you happen to call the Child Advocacy Center, we're able to mandate to report as well. So we will make that child line referral. Um, or give you the 800 number to do the child and referral to yourself. But if we get in our agency, our policy is if you give us enough information, we are required to mandate to, re to report. Yes. So we will. So, so here's the information that is reportable. 
Absolutely. And that was a change back in, I believe, 14, 2014. Um, prior to that, you had to have firsthand knowledge that an abuse occurred. Now, if your neighbor comes to you and says, I know that you are the district attorney, and I was speaking with Susie Smith over here, and she said her niece is being sexually abused. You have a duty as a mandated reporter That's to right. report that. And I've done that many times. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the law says um, reasonable cause to suspect. Yes. That's the burden that has to be met. File it. Right. Sorry, I didn't get into court training. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've said myself in the past. Reasonable cause to suspect. Yes. And yes. There is a video on, on the Crime Victims um, YouTube channel and our Facebook that informs just regular community members how they can call child line and make a report as well. Mm -hmm. So it's. We, we do receive a very large number of calls every year. Um, I pulled some data before coming here, and in 2022, in a 12-month period, our agency received 6,377 calls of suspected abuse. Um, that's a lot of calls for Fayette mm -hmm. County. Um, yeah. And it keeps us very busy. Now, of those calls, some of them were just... I don't know what to do with my son, he won't go to school, he won't do this, he won't do that. And we can refer those individuals to community programs that are available throughout our county. That doesn't mean that we've gotten involved with all 6,377. Actually, of that number, we only got involved with about 2,000, um, which again, is still a very high number. Um, We've had some struggles, as everybody else in the state of Pennsylvania has had since COVID, with staffing. Um, and as a result, our caseloads are pretty high. Um, in a perfect world, where I would like to be, is I'd like no more than 10, case, 10 cases per caseworker, because I think that in those, those situations, those caseworkers can do some really good work with families. Um, unfortunately, um, the state hasn't changed that law since, I don't know, the 1800s, it feels like. Um, and it's still 30 to 1, which is impossible for a caseworker to work with 30 families. Um, they are actively working on that, I'm being told. And once the crisis with employment goes away, they're supposed to change that. But right now, our staff's averaging um, 15 to 20 families apiece, which is really a high number. Um, when you look at the complex cases that we're dealing with, we're dealing with multi-layers of trauma, of mental health, of drug and alcohol issues with these families. Some of the families are generational um, that we're trying to work with, a generational trauma um, that has, has happened. And we keep, we keep going and we keep trying, um, but we do, we do count on the community. Um, I think, in all seriousness, CYS gets a bad rap. Um, and the reality is that we don't want your kids. We really don't. If you knew how much work it was to place a child and to try to find an appropriate placement for that child and to sit with your child while they're crying because no matter what you've put them through, they still want mom and dad, um, it's not the best part of our job in any means, shape, or form. Um, we want to work with families and we want to keep families together when that's possible, when that child is safe. Um, and I can't stress that enough. And the way we're going to do that is through each and every one of you, um, anybody that may see this recording, through my colleagues up here, we really have to step up as a community and make a difference. Um, I see one of my very dear friends who always used to tell me when she's walking through a grocery store, um, if a mom's struggling and she can tell that that mom's having a really hard time and getting really frustrated, instead of judging her, she'll step in and say, hey, can I 
help you? Can I get something for you? Is there something I can do? As a community, each and every one of us can do that, and that can make a difference. There is nothing worse than feeling like you're alone. And as I look around here, I truly believe that probably many of us had supports as we were growing up, as we may have become parents. I can sit here in all honesty and say I would never have survived my first child if it wasn't for my mother, because I had no clue. <coughs> and I wasn't young when I had her, but I had no clue what I was doing. I wasn't a mom. That was her job, not mine. <laughs> and so many of the families we come in contact with don't have a mom that's there for them for whatever reason, whether it's because that bridge was burned because of drug addiction or they're no longer in the picture for whatever reason. Uh, they need those supports, and we as a community can do that. You heard Andrea talk and you heard Corey talk about needing volunteers. We need foster parents. If you've got an extra room and you're willing to open up your home to a child that's struggling, please reach out. We'll connect you with one of the many agencies we contract with because um, kids need loving homes. And they're temporary, hopefully, and the kids can go back home, especially our teenagers. Nobody wants a teenager. I don't know why. <laughs> They're fun. <laughs> but just, <laughs> just looking inside your heart, what can you do for a child? What can you do for a family? Um, I, I just, I, I, I'm getting on my soapbox, but it is my soapbox. Um, I've been doing this work for 30 plus years. I love my job, um, and I'm not just saying that because my boss is here. I do love my job um, most days. I don't always like my job. We really need the community to step up. We need some families that are willing to open their homes. We need some families that are willing to mentor other parents and help them, provide child care for them so they can go to a counseling appointment provide childcare so they can go to their AA or their NA meetings, or just sit and talk so they have somebody that they can talk to. So I ask all of you, just look in your heart and what can you do for your next door neighbor? If you and don't mind my saying something. I don't know. I've worked very, <laughs> <laughs> worked very closely with your agency. Yes, you do. And I can say that most people don't realize that at 12 o'clock at night, and there's something violent going on in someone's home, you guys show up. Yes, we do. You don't worry about your safety. You don't worry about anything other than the kids. Mm -hmm. And I've been out there and seen them. And I think that you are correct. There is a bad rap about CYS. You guys do a tremendous job. Thank you. And I appreciate that. You know much. I've been a big supporter. Yes, you have. Forever. Yes. And I've made phone calls when things have gone wrong. And I'd ask you to take children when there was violence, when I'm not on a scene. Yeah. And you guys have come and done it. You've all these We've come. Exactly. The judge has done that part of it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't take kids. That's the yeah. judge's job. <laughs> You have a very good working relationship with us. Absolutely. And a very good working relationship with the court. And mm -hmm. I can vouch for you that there is no other than a good rap for you. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Now, there is John Fritz. <laughs> well, you know, that's a whole other story. <laughs> In all fairness to him, he is one of your greatest assets. Yes. But let me tell you, I have meetings with you every month. And we had a meeting even this morning. Mm -hmm. And I had to leave because of some things going on. But those meetings, I see some of your best people there. And that is quite many. Yes. Because I don't always see the same people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you all have done a great job. Thank you. But I also have to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> we go way back. 
<laughs> we know each other quite a few years. Yes. And I was very happy when she got appointed as the director. She has done a great job. Her agency has done a great job. Uh, just yesterday, or Monday, I think it was, when we did a homicide matter, Lisa was there the whole time. And she had to deal with five or six of the, of the family of the victim. Mm -hmm. She did a great job, too. She is non-intrusive when we are trying to deal with the, the victims ourselves. And we've had a very good working relationship. Uh, very importantly, when you, and, and you didn't even speak about the work you have to do with juvenile probation. That's right, yeah. And that work that you do with juvenile probation has been a tremendous benefit to juvenile probation. Uh, there, there has been, Andrea used to be in juvenile probation, what, all the time? 20 years, yeah. Yeah. 20 years. And she did a great job there. And I'm not singing your praise because I'm not the type of you all know. Oh, you <laughs> tell us when you disagree. We yes. know. <laughs> Good. And now we always tease Brittany at times because she's always on Zoom with us. I know. But you do. I, I, again, it's, I've been very fortunate to work with all of you. Thank you. You do a great job, Brittany. Uh, I haven't worked with you because I don't think that you're really uh, involved in the district attorney's office. Sadly, no. Yes. <laughs> but, Brittany, you are one of the best, if not the best, I've ever seen. Thank you. Yes. And, and, and let me just say, she was one of mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dr. Carrasco I stole her from me. me. I am a product of John Fritz. Oh, well, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, John, I, I'll tell you what, all of you have done a great job since I've been a district attorney. I you. really appreciate everything you've done. And it's right on when she says, nobody promises anybody. Mm -hmm. Very bluntly, let's be very honest about it. When you see that it's, it's fake, you tell us. And that has a major impact on how we handle mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always come out, well, yes, these children are telling the truth. Right. Uh, right. I can remember a time when a girl had told the whole story, and then when you left the room, she started primping, she was basically whimpering and everything. Then she was extremely happy, primping, primping and everything. Mm -hmm. And I watched that tape several times because I had this clear or not clear of someone. Right. And I think you may remember which one I'm talking about. Don't we say so it. many. Oh no. <laughs> no. But so those kind of things. Absolutely. And as a forensic interviewer in our role, we do have to remain neutral. But we are trained and we go through many different training hours and research articles and just different things like that to look at the signs of coaching or just body language and different things like that. So although we might not be able to say um, exactly like, yes, for sure this kiddo is being coached, we can say, well, the kid was doing this behavior or not doing this or acting in some type of way that would help the investigation. Yeah. And, and things such as the use of certain terminology mm -hmm. that a yes. young kid would not have any clue what it Absolutely. And when that, when that comes out, that, that is a red flag. Yep, yeah, we pick up on but all of that. But it's been extremely worthwhile to have you doing those. Thank and you. by the way, did they ever come down and fix that window? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still like that. Yeah. Uh, you know. Dr. J, you're doing it, I do. So I, I have this, I work for a large institution according to our institution, I am required to notify my supervisor when there has been a disclosure of physical or sexual abuse. Will you clarify the law? The law says you have to notify us, or child mine, which is the 1-800 number, but which you comes prefer, to us. You prefer here in this county? Call us first, call child line second. Unfortunately, child line it covers the entire state, mm -hmm. and by the time we get the referral, that child may be not where they were. It may be five or six hours later. You're sitting there wondering, why, where is CYS? Why aren't they here? Mm -hmm. We haven't found out about it yet. 
So we ask the call us first, call child line second, so you meet your legal requirement. Yes. Sir, you have a question? Yeah, so my question is kind of the opposite of Mr. Powers. Um, so when, when a child line is made and it seems to be uh, a credible um, report of abuse or neglect, mm -hmm. um, and often we hear child who can't because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the reasons why we try to respond um, as quickly as possible because if that child's in school or in a clinician's office or someplace like that where we can talk to the child privately without the parents, we're more apt to get some honest information from that child as opposed to being in the house where the alleged perpetrator may be in the next room we do try to do our interviews alone. Um, we have had many cases over the years where children have recanted. Um, we continue to work with that child in the hopes that they'll recant their recantation, for, if that's the case. But if that child um, <coughs> is not telling their story, there's not a lot any of us can do. Um, I had personally a child I worked with as a caseworker that would always come. I was always on call when this, these reports came in, and she would always disclose that her father was sexually assaulting her. I believed her a thousand percent. There was no reason to not. We would take steps to make sure she was safe because the father was the only parent she had. She would, dis she would recant. This went on and on for years, where I knew this child was being abused, but I couldn't do anything. The last investigation I had with her, it wasn't a situation of recanting anymore because she was pregnant, and the DNA um, tests were able to be done, and he was uh, prosecuted and convicted. Um, but that child wasn't ready to tell that story. Um, and a, a lot of what, um, I think my colleagues would say up here, is sometimes it takes multiple times. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes just letting that child know that you're a safe person to talk to. Um, and why that child picks any one individual, I will never know. Um, we've had, you know, kids disclose to people that you wouldn't think, you know, that doesn't, but they, for whatever reason, feel safe. And again, something the community can do is just to be that safe person when that child's ready. Can I, Does that I answer wanna, your question? I, guess, yeah. I was going to follow up with what Gina was saying that with our organization, when we have, we have three counselors that when we usually get our referrals from Children and Youth and Child Advocacy Center, sometimes the child will recant, sometimes they won't even disclose. We look at those individuals as, regardless of what the situation was, we will provide that service to them. So we continuously will offer supportive counseling to them as long as they want it. It's not forced. Uh, we've had a lot of kids that have not disclosed or recanted, and then after coming to services, not even just our own services, but even if they would go to a counselor or a therapist, sometimes they just need to know that there's a safe place, and they will then possibly disclose and when that happens we've child line cases numerous times because it was like we child line they've done a forensic no nothing there they've come back for services disclosed again so it's just sometimes it's a cycle that we have to go through but we all of us up here provide those services that if a child wants to tell their story they're given opportunities to tell their story it just might not be right away it might take time we've had adults that we've had services for that were abused as children and never told until they become an adult because that was their time that they felt safe to tell. And that's why it's important for us to do what we do here because we're here then available for them when that time comes. So um, sometimes it might not be as soon as what we want it to be or the family wants it to be, but that's again, that's, that, that's when that child or that victim, they are the ones that have that control to be able to decide when they want to tell and do.
piggyback off of that, I have had a few cases where I've interviewed siblings and they have reported to me seeing dad do something to one of the other siblings and that sibling would not tell me anything. She would not crack at all. Um, and obviously I can't badger her, I can't ask her, you know, I know what happened, you tell me now. And she wouldn't really report it to anybody, but because we knew the siblings saw something, CYS was able to put them in a safe spot. And so then she got a little bit more comfortable and then she started opening up and I do believe she had either regular or outside of CBC, mm -hmm. other counseling, or she went there and they just worked with her and then she finally was able to open up and then she came back for another forensic and we talked through it and she made her disclosure. I think it's important to note that, that that's something that child can control when they choose to tell um, and they've lost so much control through the abuse process that that's still something they hold on to and they control. I think you guys can tell sometimes kids don't know they're being abused. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yes. They don't know. Yeah. They think it's normal. Yeah. We've, through the years doing our prevention programs in the school, we have gotten many disclosures from kids that once they realized that, oh, this wasn't, that this shouldn't be happening to me, this, you know, that, that shouldn't happen, they will come up and disclose to us. Um, and that we've done a lot, we were able to provide a lot of services to them that way because they didn't even tell their teachers, but when we would be in the schools. So it's important really to educate, yes. educate children, um, communicate with your children, and just be there for support for your children because sometimes that's what they want and they 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 want someone safe to, t to tell or talk yes. to especially we find that a lot of times the offender is a known person it's not the stranger danger that we used to be taught about back when we were in school stranger danger we know now more it's not necessarily a stranger that is committing that crime it's a family member it's a neighbor it's somebody known 90% um, of the time yes. the kid knows the person who's abusing mm -hmm. them and loves them. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And doesn't want them to get in trouble. I, I can't tell you how many times a kid has said to me, I don't want daddy to go to jail. I don't want mommy to go to jail. I just want it to stop. Mm -hmm. Cause when that's it's decided, like, so when that does happen and the child does, either doesn't tell you the same thing they told the, the reporter or we can't, does the person that made the report notify so that they, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll think, okay, if it if it is a mandated reporter that makes the report and it's a child abuse investigation we are able to share that information whether or not the case was substantiated and whether or not services were provided over and above that we can't share any information if it's a non-mandated um, provider, the next door neighbor, relative, whomever. No, we cannot release any information back. If I could say one more thing. Sure. Uh, it, it's very interesting, the doctors that you also work with, mm -hmm. they are very dedicated to helping you guys out. Absolutely. I mean, just like this morning's meeting, we had, what, four doctors on the yes. line? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think five, actually. Was five. It five? Yeah. yeah. And, and I didn't recognize you because of the Penn State. What's the word go Penn State? But, you know, very bluntly, that there are some very good doctors who do the same thing and will tell us no or yes. It's right. not where they're contrived. It's Absolutely. very straightforward and very it neutral. And I think you're making a really good point, Rich, that, that I think I need to stress a little bit. It's not one entity. It is the team approach, whether it's law enforcement, the district attorney's office, um, the various providers, the four of us up here. We can't, none of us, none of us can do this job and protect kids without everybody else. Well, just look at this morning. Absolutely. We had police were there, mm -hmm. the doctors were there, how many people sat in that room, yeah. David Ryder was there. Yeah, we had about 20, 25 people in that meeting, people. 
and the wealth of knowledge yes. from their own expertise as well as just being able to sit in that room and share information. I think that there was information that not all entities had going into that meeting that is going to then be able to help us resolve that case. And the interesting thing is the question, the, the yes. fine detail that everyone was getting into, and yes. it's not like, uh, it, it's not something that's planned, it's, it's a very large debate going on in right. the room. Yeah, and this is what I saw, this is what I thought, this is what, mm -hmm. Hey, wait a minute, you saw that, well, I saw this, and let's try to figure that well, out. Like what the NTs told us. Absolutely, we had no knowledge of that, no, and they, had they not participated. Explained to, they chimed in and they explained what all those red marks were. Mm -hmm. That was just, uh, that's Absolutely. the way it's always been. That's, yes. It is. And that, that's one thing that we have here in Fayette County that a lot of counties do not have. There is no turf wars. Um, I talk to my counterparts across the state, and what do you mean you have conversations with your district attorney? Well, I have to. That's part of what we do. Um, you know, why do you get along with your behavioral health or your drug and alcohol? Or, because we have to. I, I can't sit here and say that I am the be all and do all, and my agency knows it all, because we don't by any means. And very bluntly, when you work with us, I mean, how many times do you call me a month? <laughs> Quite a few. Quite a few. <laughs> and, and we hash it out. Yes. And then we have we have at least one meeting a month. Mm -hmm. But then we also have meetings, impromptu meetings, where I'll come out in the right. office. And so, so everybody knows the meeting Rich is referring to is called a multidisciplinary um, team meeting that includes um, law enforcement, the district attorney's office, and my office. A, along with somebody from a child's place, um, Crime Victim Center is a participant in that, as well as behavioral health and drug and alcohol. And all the doctors. Yes, and any of the doctors that are involved in that particular case. The purpose of those meetings is very similar to what happens with the forensic interviews. It's so that we can all share whatever information we have gathered through our processes so that we can better serve the families that come before us. Um, I can remember, again, I'm old, back when I started, um, one of my very best friends was a state cop. And when I told him this was the job I had accepted, he said, it's people like you that ruin this world. Oh, you soft-hearted <laughs> social workers. <laughs> and I'm like, but, and, and this was somebody I looked up to. He was like a father figure to me. And I was like, how can you say that? Um, back then, we didn't refer to law enforcement until we substantiated the case mm -hmm. and we, everything was done with. We didn't go out with them. We didn't work with them. And that evolved over the years. And we now freely share information back and forth. We have a very positive working relationship. Um, well, it's, it, inter it's interesting when we're sitting in the office, my office, and having those meetings, and something is asked, and we just call the police right then and there. Right. If they're not there. Yes. Right. And they give us answers. Yeah. Yes. You know, we know when they're done. We know when they're not done. They tell us what they're doing right there, so that we don't have to wait around for right. days. And many times, that's what we're waiting on because yes. we don't want to interfere in a law enforcement investigation, and vice versa. So we do need that interaction to, again, best serve our families. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Do you care if you need anything? I don't. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, I'll ask one question. I know uh, Gina's already talked about it some, but for Corey and Brittany and Andrea, how can the community help what you do? Corey? Um, like I said, um, when I was going over CASA, we are currently looking for volunteers. There are many cases that come in, and there are many cases that are in front of our courts right now that could benefit from a CASA volunteer, and that could be any of you um, if you want to be there and help the kids through some of the hardest times in their life and be that support for them. Please give me a call at our CASA office or give me an email um, because you could really help a kid. Mm -hmm. 
or children. Um, and also, we are doing a bunch of other fundraisers, so just come out and support us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, For um, the Child Advocacy Center, I think one big thing is just being vig vigilant within the community. If you see something, if you think something isn't sitting right, or if you're at the grocery store and you're like, oh, that's like, what's going on over there? I'm not sure, report it. CYS cannot help families aid in family or aid with families, anything like that, if they don't know the family exists, if they don't know there's issues going on, anything like that. Also, she had talked about education. Education into the schools or just us doing trainings in different professional agencies, getting word out there and educating our kids, all of that can hopefully and eventually lead to prevention, but I mean, we'll always have a job here, I'm sure, <laughs> but... In the perfect world. Would yeah. your job easier if the parents taught their kids the right words for their body? Absolutely, and that's weird because I have that written on my sheet. Uh, I just didn't <laughs> say it. Um, so, along with education, teaching correct body names, words that are appropriate for their bo body parts, not like butterfly and hot dog, so... <laughs> Oh, that was rough for me. When I first started the Crime Victim Center, and they all can attest, because most they're all here with me when we started, I did not say those words. And I was like, I'm not teaching my children those words um, that I had to learn through the years. <laughs> that, and I still blush. Because we just, I'm a farm girl. We just, you know, I was sheltered in my life growing up. But, uh, but no, that's, that's very truthful. It is, you do have to because we do hear a lot of those stories of what people call things and it's like, well, where'd you come up with that yeah. name? But I understand that. But uh, I, along with um, Corey, same thing, volunteers. Uh, we are huge need of volunteers to help with all the many things that we do at our organization, our outreach events, um, our fundraising events, because that's something else, being that we are grant, uh, grant funded we need money. We, we all need money. Um, so that is something that's very important for us as well. Our volunteers can go to court, uh, can go to the hospital and be with that victim, can uh, offer support through the whole legal process. We might just have a volunteer that wants to come in and just um, help in the office, doing office work. We, we had a volunteer that used to come and when our uh, office manager would be off on vacation, which is Bunny back there, when she'd be off on vacation, we would have a volunteer come in and answer the phones and just do the everyday office things. And that's important because if not staff does it, other staff has to do it. And if, you know, we're busy doing something, then you know we have to worry about answering the phones, we have to worry about people coming in off the street needing services. We want to always have our presence be known. So um, a volunteer is, is wonderful to need as well. And again, I think like, like uh, Brittany said, education in the community, the more work, the referrals. If we don't have people educated in the community, then you can't provide those referrals to friends, family, neighbors, whoever you see that are in need then you then they can't get the services from us so getting the referrals to us is important um, one of the things i didn't talk about again i know with the, the whole juvenile probation i'm not going to talk about that but we the crime victim center right now is the only organization in fayette county that does um, sexual violence protection orders so if a victim is sexually assaulted you can reach out to us and we we will uh, assist you in applying for that protection order through the court system. And then we do pro um, protection from intimidation. And that is when you have an individual that's under the age of 18 and the offender is over the age of 18 and they might be harassed. They might just be some weird situations going on and that victim does not feel comfortable. They're able to get a protection from intimidation. Um, we do not do domestic violence. That is one thing my organization does not do currently. We have to refer to Southwestern um, PA Domestic Violence Services. They will do the PFA orders and we will refer to them for domestic violence cases. So that those are differences in our organizations, but we will refer to them to make sure that that victim is being taken care of as well. So, thank you. Anybody else have questions or comments? Chuck? I have a question. I need help. I spent a good bit of November and December 
seeing large quantities of children who find that it's good to trust the Santa Claus, to say things to Santa Claus. And they could be one of many, like 350 on our yuck favorite Christmas in a day, 350. Last year, I had a young man come to me, and I had known his name, and I said, Bobby, how are you? And he said, I'm, I'm OK. I said, well, so what would you like for Christmas? He said, I just want my dad to stop hitting me and my brother. Now, 10 seconds later, it's old. All I know is his name is Bob. I don't even know if it's real, but I could tell by the way he was acting, this was not a story. I've seen Kids it. don't lie to Santa it. Claus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially at Christmas. Well, the way it works is we have a group of elves that give us the name we talk about. I was just thinking that, boy, if somebody could volunteer from one of the agencies and be an elf, and then I could say, I just heard that, they could talk to them real quickly, it might be a real beneficial thing. I, I like that idea, yeah. and I like so what you're I, thinking. Yeah. I do. I usually get one year that's telling me something that they wouldn't tell anybody else. Right. I like that idea. That's now. Yeah. November 18th. Uh -huh. You're a volunteer. <laughs> yeah. As long as I don't have to wear an elf <laughs> question could be, um, I'm certified to give mandated reporting training, whether you need it for a license or just want to be a mandated reporter. So, I mean, I could come back to the same space another day and anybody who wants mandated reporting can get it so you know what the law states, what information you need to get, and what you do with it. If I were a mandated reporter, I understand the responsibility mm -hmm. But at that point, the only thing I have is another 300 kids in line, and I know his name is Bob. Well, if you right. said Bobby, where do you live? And he said Connorsville. Yeah. That's could still important. Why don't you also do this? Why don't you have every child to walk a little form? <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> think how difficult that would be if yeah, you, you, you have very know. limited information. I said I can honestly see how difficult that would be having very limited information. So yeah. mm -hmm. here for our panelists.